Hello, my name is Pastor Scott Ingram, and I want to describe to you in this video uh, a day that is coming that you will be in attendance at. A great meeting, a meeting when everyone, the lost, the saved, they will all stand before Jesus Christ. The day that I'm speaking of is the Judgment Day. There's a lot of misconceptions, there's a lot of mistruths about what this day is and what it's going to be. But friends, I, I, I'll have you know right now, it will be the most awesome experience that you will ever be involved in. And everyone that has ever lived upon the face of the earth will be there before the throne of God. And they will stand there in awe before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as he passes the judgment upon them according to their works. We've been going through a study of dispensationalism for some time now, and dispensations basically just separate out the Bible in the different stages of time and how God has dealt with man. Uh, we have come to the future. Uh, the rapture of the church has taken place. There has been seven years of tribulation, and uh, after those seven years, uh, Christ returned and the millennium began. It's a thousand year reign of Christ on a physical earth is what the Bible teaches. But at the end of this thousand year reign, Judgment Day. And that's what I want you to hear here today. Please listen closely to what I'm about to describe from the Word of God. Because I don't want one soul to end there on that day, on the wrong side of eternity. Tonight, I want to discuss uh, a topic that really gives me chills when I think about it. It is the last day, uh, the final day, the judgment day, uh, that we've all heard about. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, but we've all heard about it. For example, Hollywood often... Uh, has a different take on the Judgment Day, don't they? I remember uh, an old movie, uh, Ghostbusters, they had, and the guy he was talking about the Judgment Day, and they had all these ghosts flying around. You know, just a silly movie, and uh, he misquote he quoted this verse about Judgment Day, and he misquoted it. It was the wrong verse, so that showed how close they looked at what the Bible said about the Judgment Day, right? Um, but but Hollywood does that. The Judgment Day is either filled with robots or ghosts or who knows what else, right? Uh, aliens, you know. Uh, but Christians often get the Judgment Day wrong too. Uh, a lot of people have this idea of Judgment Day being, and I, I thought this so funny, I saw a picture this week of a guy, he's standing there, and it, it shows St. Peter, and he's got a desk in heaven, right? A desk in heaven. And, and people are coming up to his desk and sign off. Another picture showed an angel with a desk and Folks, I, that, that might be what you have in your mind, but folks, I have no doubt in my mind there ain't no desk in heaven, okay? <laughs> well, we get weird ideas, and really, if we want to understand this day, uh, we just need to look to the Bible, right? Amen. I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, so the first place I want to look in the Bible is Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I believe this tells us what the final day of planet Earth will be like. It says there, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame. Remember that. And his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. The final day. We're coming to the very end of the book of Revelation. We're coming to the very end of this world as we know it. And that would be this judgment day. You know, we've heard all our lives that Christ will return, that there'll be a resurrection of the dead, that there'll be a judgment. Those three things, right? The thing that many people misunderstand, though, is all of these things happen in stages. When I say there's going to be a return of Christ, I mean there's going to be a rapture and a second coming. That's what I mean. 
When I say there's going to be a resurrection, I'm saying, yes, there's going to be a resurrection. But there's going to be a first resurrection. There's going to be a second resurrection. Matter of fact, there's already been a resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the grave, didn't He? And that begins the first resurrection. So as I say, if you don't understand these stages, you won't understand the judgment either because there's two stages to the judgment as well. First of all, Christ's return. It comes in two stages, the rapture and the second coming. You see this clearly in Titus 2.13. The Bible says, looking for that blessed hope. What is that church? That's the rapture of the church. It's the blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm looking for that in two stages, right? I know there'll be a rapture. There'll be a tribulation seven years. Then there'll be a second coming of Jesus Christ, right? Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, also, the resurrection has two stages. The Bible, I mean, it flat out tells you there is a first and there is a second resurrection, right? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 26, it lays this out. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit to them asleep. See, he's the first fruit. That started the first resurrection when Christ rose from the dead. Because the resurrection is, is more uh, than just coming back from the dead, the resurrection is coming back to live forevermore in this glorified body. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be man alive. But listen to this. How can it be even more clear? But every man in his own order. <laughs> every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. That's the first one. And afterward, they that are at Christ at His coming. The rapture and the beginning of the millennium. There'll be the rapture of the Old Testament saints. So right there, at His coming will be the rest of the resurrection. Then cometh the end when He shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when He shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for He must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So that's the first resurrection. I'm going to be in the first resurrection because I know Jesus is my Savior, right? Amen. I'll be in that. Now, the second resurrection, I won't be in. I hope you don't want nobody else to be in either because that will be the resurrection of damnation, right? These will be the people that are coming in that. Talks about that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So right before this judgment day occurs, all of the dead come back. Everybody who has ever lived, everybody who's lost comes back. And it says it the second resurrection. And then it says, This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, so that uh, speaks to what's coming ahead. So there's these two different phases. Now, in the same way, the judgment, your judgment, will happen in two different phases. Uh, the judgment uh, comes in two stages. One at death uh, for salvation, and later on there'll be one for the works that you've done in your body. The first one happens um, at the moment of death. It's appointed a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment, right? what the Hebrew says. Uh, uh, to prove that, uh, first stage here of the judgment is our salvation. It began, salvation began when you received Jesus, but it's not confirmed, it's not shown clearly until you're dead. When you die, you will instantly be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't go lay around some grave. You don't sit around and wait for the judgment. No, you are instantly in the presence of where you're going to be from eternity. You'll either be in heaven or you'll be in hell. The Bible says very clearly, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. It says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. And what church? And to be present with the Lord. That's where you go if you're a Christian. But where does the, uh, where does, uh, the, the sinner man go? It goes to hell immediately. Uh, Luke 16, 22 through 23. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Instantaneously. So the judgment of salvation is instant. Point that man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. But the second stage of the judgment is a judgment of your works, what you've done, this body. And this is what a lot of Christians fail to realize. Like she was saying here a moment ago, she said that there's these churches where these people are getting involved and getting drunk and they're in the leadership of the church. Folks, there's going to be a judgment on them for what they're doing. Yeah. All right? Amen. There's going to be a judgment of their works one day. And they're going to have to answer for what they did. We 
are going to have to answer for what we did in our body. And that's why I tremble when I think about these things. We're going to have to stand before God and give an account. Okay? And that should cause us to be concerned, right? Now before I begin this, uh, some people believe the judgment of our works will be broken into two phases as well. They believe that there'll be this Bema seat judgment and there'll be this great white throne judgment. Now I've studied over these things for a long time and uh, I see both of these together. I can't see any time given separately for the judgment of believers when it'll occur, but it all seems to come together in one judgment at the last day. Now some people disagree and that's fine, that's good. They might see it a different way. We'll find out when we get there. But I want to show you tonight why I think this way. Do you fear or welcome fire? I kind of fear it. When I was a little kid, I was walking along, somebody come along, and they put a piece of cigarette on my hand. And I danced back, right? Now that hurt me. It burned me, right? But you could take a piece of gold and you put it through fire, what will it do? It'll purify it. It'll melt it down, but it'll make it pure. The purity will come to the top, right? God's going to take us through the fire. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He's going to take us all through the fire. Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 through 3 says this, but who may abide the day of His coming? And who shall stand when He appeareth? For He is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer the Lord an offering in righteousness. See, He's a refiner's fire. And it makes all the difference. A forest fire, it comes through, it destroys and eradicates everything, Right? A refiner's fire, though, doesn't consume it completely like the fire of an incinerator. A refiner's fire purifies. And that's what it'll do to the Christian one day when we go through the fire. It's going to purify. Matter of fact, a lot of times we go through the fire now in this life, don't we? Do we not go through some fire? Does God not send some fire our way to purify us? He does, my friend. He does. And He does these things for a reason. It'll melt down that bar of silver or gold, but it separates out all the impurities that ruin its value, burns them up, and leaves the silver and gold intact. He is like a refiner's fire, is what the Scripture says, right? Now keep that in mind as we describe the end of the world here. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, is where all this is described. It says there, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. This is the very last day of the world, the, the judgment day. The, the, what I was talking about in Daniel. It goes on there to say, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. The books for judgment. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Now the book of life is open. That's a book that shows salvation, isn't it? And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Remember that. This is a judgment according to your works. It goes on to say, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Again, it's according to your works is what this final judgment is. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And immediately after this, what happens? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. What happened between judgment day and a new earth? Can I tell you what happened? The fire happened. The earth was completely taken away of all the evil, all the sin all around. And eternity is unraveled before our eyes in that day. Now, notice what it says there. It says that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So that means there were people there also who were found that were written in the book of life because they couldn't be not written if they weren't already there. But who may abide the day of His coming? Who shall stand when He appeareth? Well, the first thing you've got to understand is who's the judge? Who's the judge, church? I think you know. Jesus, right? Revelation, or rather John chapter 5, 21 through 29 explains this very well. It says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth him he will. Raising up the dead once again. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. what the Scripture says. It goes on to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. We'll get through the judgment day, my friend. We'll get through it and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 
The hour is coming, it says, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The first and the second resurrection. The first resurrection has been going on for a long time. The second resurrection will be all them people out of hell coming out of it, right? For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. Listen to this very closely. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, right? That's the second resurrection. Now, the final judgment, as I said here, is a judgment of works. It ain't just about salvation. It ain't just about salvation. Matter of fact, it says there a couple of times, it says that it's a judgment of works. Uh, salvation was determined at death, right? That's when your salvation was determined. And all means all. It says all will be at the final judgment. Uh, as I said, some people say believers won't be at the great white throne, but that absolutely does not make sense because the Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. He's not going to put me over in a corner somewhere when this goes on, okay? I'm going to be with the Lord forevermore. Forevermore. And not one verse confirms those two separate judgments of works. Uh, it's not found, like I said, those there, they're not found written in the book of life. So that, that book's brought out for a reason. It's to show who's written in and who isn't, right? So the idea there between those two is not that the, uh, the righteous won't be there, but the point is that the unrighteous will be judged and cast away from the righteous in that day, right? They'll be cast off in the lake of fire. Now the word all is all over Scripture that all are going to appear before judgment. Uh, Romans 14, 10 through 12 says this, For we shall all, all means all, don't it? As far as I can tell, all means all, all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us. Every one of us are going to give an account of himself to God. Everyone. Goes on to make it even more clear. He talks about Christians and non-Christians in this next verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done. That's a judgment of works, right? Whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Paul says... We persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. He says here, I'm going out and persuading the lost because I know the judgment days are coming, okay? They need to get prepared. They need to be ready for what's coming. Now, I may be wrong. It may be two separate ones, and if it is, <laughs> praise God, that's good too. But as far as I can tell, this is how it all goes down. So, what happens in that day for an unbeliever and for a believer on judgment day? The unbeliever, the one who was resurrected in the second resurrection, uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 11, 21 through 22. He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they, should have, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. He's, he's fussing about this group. He's saying they haven't repented. Here I am before you and you don't even see it. And he says, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable, listen to that, more tolerable, for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. What is God doing there on that day of judgment? He's looking over these people. He's looking at their works. He's seeing what they've done, these lost people. And God is so merciful and kind. He is actually has a different levels of how much hell they're going to get. Is that not what it says? Is that not what it says? Now, that don't mean hell they're going to be happy you know, by no means. But I believe some people are going to burn a little hotter than others, okay? By that verse, by what Jesus Himself says here, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. So that's why he's judging their works. Because he's a, he's, a, he's a just God. Our God is just. you know that? They may want to put him down. They want to make him out like he's some kind of tyrant and all these things. Our God is just. He always does what's right. He is love. And he is God, right? He always does what's right. And that's what he's going to do with the unbelievers, those who would reject him. But what about us believers? What will happen to us in that day? Notice how fire is mentioned through here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 to 15, this is you all, us sitting here tonight that believe in Jesus Christ. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
How was that laid? Ephesians 2, 8. By grace through faith, right? I come in through Jesus Christ, right? That's my foundation. Now then, then, I, then I get to build something. Now if any man build upon this foundation, Ephesians 2, 10, God hath before ordained that the works that we should walk in them. And we build upon the foundation of Christ. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. See, there's two different things there you build. There's things that's going to last and there's things that's not going to last through the fire, okay? Every man's work, it says, shall be made manifest. This is the judgment of your works, of what you've done for the Lord. For the day shall declare it. What day is that? That's the day of the Lord, my friend. That's the judgment day. Because it shall be revealed by fire. By fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. And <laughs> we're walking into eternity, my friend, with the reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Some of us are going to suffer some loss in that day. Because we ain't done a whole lot of works for the Lord. We've done a lot of works for ourselves. For our own pride, our own uh, building ourselves up. Some of us are going to walk in a little more than others, right? According to what this says. Now why fire? Why is fire being used to go through here? Because it purifies or it consumes. The world will be judged by fire. All this world will go through the fire. You hear what I'm saying? And the fire is this. The fire happens between Revelation chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 21. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 13 makes this very clear. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As being, some men count slackness. He's made a promise. He's going to judge the world, right? He's made a promise. But His long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He is letting this world go on a few more days. Why? So some more can come in. And He knows exactly who's going to come in, okay? But He's, he's allowing time. And then it says, but the day of the Lord will come in as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord lasts for a thousand and seven years. It begins at the rapture of the church and it ends at the end of the millennium, okay? A thousand and seven years. So that's a long day, Scott. Well, I guess the next part of that verse might help the, about where it says about the well, a day of the Lord is like a thousand years, right? <laughs> right there you go. But this is a thousand years. It comes in like a thief. How? With the rapture. It comes in like a thief in the night. It's what the rapture is described as. But how does it go out? Well, it tells you right there after it says that, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up, right? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, everything, all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting into what? The coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for what? What's going to happen between Revelation chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 21? A new heaven and a new earth, right? That's what's coming. And we're going to be there. We're going to see it. We're going to go through that fire. We're in dwelleth righteousness. Living for this material world is about the stupidest thing you can do. Living for yourself is the stupidest thing you can do. Because all of it's going to get burned up. You hear me? Everything. It's going to all get burned. All that's going to be left is those righteousness. And the only righteousness you can have is through Christ. And then you can build on that foundation, can't you? You can build on it. I tell you, I get excited thinking about this. Amen. This is going to be something, my friends. What else does it say? Do you think doesn't the Bible don't go, say the Bible don't all fit together? My friends, it fits together, okay? All across the centuries, it fits together. Malachi chapter 3, verse uh, 5 and 6. This, this continues that passage I read earlier out of Malachi. It says, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and the adulterers, all that sin, against the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, those who are, who are putting down the, the working man and not giving him his wages, the widow, and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, those that won't help their brothers and sisters. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. What does it mean to be consumed? To be completely burned up. And who's not going to be completely burned up? The sons, right? Amen. We are the sons of God. The sons and daughters of God are not going to be consumed in that day. But the rest will be cast. In the lake of fire, the lake of fire to burn forevermore. You know, it's eternity. 
Bible uses the same word for heaven as it does for hell. If hell, if hell don't last forever, then heaven ain't going to last forever, okay? Same thing. So this fire, this fire. You see, from the moment of salvation, my refining process has been going on. Yours too, right? It started, and, and we don't have to fear being consumed in that day, but the fire will hurt us, won't huh? But who gets to see God? Who gets to see God? You know what Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 says? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does the fire do? It purifies, doesn't it? It purifies. So those are the ones who are going to see God. 1 Peter 1, 7 makes it clear that you must come through the fire, though. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory. When, my friend? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. This whole Bible goes together. If anything you've learned through this study of dispensationalism and dispensational understanding, all of this fits together. It's all going to come to pass because all the prophecies before about the Christ coming, the first time came to pass, all the prophecies about the second coming are going to come to pass as well, just exactly as it's laid out. Maybe today's message has made you think about what your life is all about, what you're living for. Uh, maybe it's made you think, you know, maybe I need something more than all of this. Can I tell you, our Lord Jesus Christ died and came and rose again to give you something more, to give you true life, is what the Scripture says. And therefore, on that first judgment, you'll open your eyes in heaven. And therefore, on that second judgment, you'll only build on the foundation of what He has prepared for you to do in His kingdom. I, I, I want to pray with you right now and ask you just to, Repeat after me, you know, or just say it in your own words. Just ask the Lord Jesus like this. Just say, Lord Jesus, I am so sorry for my sin. Lord, I, I want to confess to you right now that I can do nothing to earn your salvation. But Lord, I want to trust in you. I want to receive the gift, the gift of salvation from your hand that only you can give and only you can offer. Lord, I receive it right now. I receive it and I thank you for it, Lord. And I thank you for saving my soul. And I now know that for all eternity, I will be with you. And I praise you, my King, my Lord, my Savior, my God. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you prayed that prayer today. I hope you find a church close to you that uh, will bring you in and, and uh, teach you about all the wonderful things that this Bible speaks about. And uh, if you're in our area, please come by and visit with us at Omega Baptist Church. And I thank you for watching this video. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube. But I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. We have worship each Sunday at 10.30 and 6.30 p.m. I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.